really warm welcome to each of you. Thank you so much for joining us today for this, uh, the first Deep Adaptation Q&A. And today we are joined by Stephen Wright. Stephen, thank you for being here. So I have the deep honour of uh, serving with Stephen on the, as members of the Deep Adaptation Forum holding group. So Stephen is um, an interfaith minister and spiritual director and trustee for the Sacred Space Foundation, which is a retreat and guidance center in the Northwest of England. Um, Stephen offers spiritual guidance as well as support in development of the practice of healing, spiritual care, conflict resolution and leadership. He's, he's also uh, an author. I've got one of his books here, which I hope we'll hear a little bit more about later. Stephen, it's really, really great that you've joined us. Thank you. I'm curious whether there is anything else about you that you would like people to know. Oh, I have an Enneotype 3 personality, so I'll keep going. <laughs> um, no, but uh, we can explore that a little more about how many of those things that you've said are, while they're me, they're not me. And that'll be, I think, part of our subject matter for everyone today. Thanks. So I'm, I'll, I'll jump straight in because there are a lot of things that I would uh, really love to hear you speaking about. Um, so the first thing that I want to ask you to speak about is um, maybe really, really simply the, the connection between spirituality and well-being and particularly in the context of facing the enormity, the existential terror um, of looking into unfolding collapse of societies. If, if I play for a minute with the notion of spirituality and well-being, I would say spirituality is well-being. If we look at the evidence, what keeps us healthy in the world is a sense of connection to the world, to each other, to ourselves, and for most people, a sense of the something other. It has all kinds of names. Some call it God. I tend to avoid that word because it's so gender driven. But if we look at the evidence for what keeps us healthy, makes us, gives us a sense of well being, what subverts it primarily is stuff that is fear driven, whatever that fear source is. And we can add into the mix at the moment a sense that I have that there's never been a time in my lifetime when there's been so much fear about. When I was a teenager, there was a lot of fear because we all thought we were going to die because the bomb was going to drop. But that was about it. There was the one thing. Now we have a deep sense of fear in the world because of more of us are aware of cultural collapse, climate collapse, political collapse, so on and so on and so forth, and a pandemic on top of it. And the signals everywhere are be afraid, be afraid. Now we know that fear compromises not least your immune system at a physiological level. It suppresses it over a long-term period. Therefore, anything that takes the breaks off that immune system by releasing, by relieving the fear is more inclined to make us healthy. And we know there are four, um, four things I call the four F's that help us towards that. And one of them is faith. The other is fellowship. The other is free giving, being involved in something where we give and not necessarily expect something back. And the third, the fourth is fulfilling work. Now, if I go to the first one of faith, what we know is that people who have some sense of connection to each other, the world, and possibly there's something other, they are more likely to feel less fearful in the world QED, if you're less fearful, you're more likely to feel a sense of wellness and happiness and health in the world at a physiological, a psychological, at a spiritual level. And um, I'm reminded of 
that deep philosopher, Peggy Lee, when she sang that Lieber and Stoller song, uh, if that's all there is, if that's all there is, break out the booze and let's keep dancing. Just break out the booze and let's keep dancing. And that is one of the responses to the A spiritual world. When you feel there is no meaning to life, to yourself, to purpose of being here, then one response is just get drunk and keep dancing. There are others, but that's one for now. Thank you. I'm noticing that those four F's that you shared, three of them stand even for people for whom the word spiritual doesn't necessarily mean anything, doesn't have a personal resonance. Mm -hmm. And the first one, faith, yeah, it can be it can be replaced by what you just what you just last described. It's just a sense of meaning, purpose, yeah. which is beyond the self. If we look at the evidence on that faith one, there is no evidence that it is necessarily faith in a God. It could be faith in your football team. It could be faith in life. It could be faith in your family. But you believe in something, something that gives you a sense of meaning and purpose for being alive and being here. And arguably, the deep adaptation movement is a faith-based movement in the sense that it's giving huge, and XR and things like that, it's giving huge numbers of people a sense of a reason to be here if mm -hmm. it's only to save the planet or save ourselves. So that, you know, we are human belongings as well as human beings. And that feeling that we need to connect with something. And for most people, it's some, from the mystical point of view, the something other is real. It's not something esoteric or it actually is a tangible quality of the nature of the reality of the co cosmos. So, um, yeah. Are we all involved in deep DA in the deep faith movement? Who knows? Mm. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to remind people here that if they would, uh, if you would like to submit a question to ask to Stuart, you can do so by sending that in a, a direct message to Stuart, and he's going to field those questions. Mm. So, to you, spirituality is is well-being mm -hmm. so i'm curious to hear uh to hear you speak to the um the phenomenon of spiritual bypass if spiritual if if faith is a story if the practices are there to help us feel better um yeah what about spiritual bypass in this context mm. first of all i would say if I stretch the word spiritual, everybody is spiritual. There are people who say, well, I'm not spiritual. <laughs> but everybody seeks meaning and purpose and direction and love and connection in life. Everybody does. Now, whether you find that meaning, purpose and connection, for example, in atheism or nihilism or the deep adaptation movement or God or whatever, you are finding a meaning and purpose. So it's to be to say I'm not spiritual is a kind of oxymoron. Because to say I'm not spiritual is your spirituality. It's the way you find meaning and purpose in the world. Uh, but of course, it's because spiritual is associated with some sense of divinity or a divine quality or something like that. Some people are put off by it. But it may well be that people are finding their spiritual expression, expressing their spirituality through uh, activism to protect the planet, for example. Um, as to regards spiritual bypassing, uh, there's some strength in me that says, well, if whatever you're doing, like you're doing mindfulness meditation, it makes you feel better, fine, go ahead and do it. You know, in a world that's full of terror, if it makes you feel better and enables you to function better, let's not distinction, let's not be too precious about what spiritual practices might be really for. But if we look down the long history of civilization whatever that is we find that people across all nations in all cultures have at some point turned towards the something other of a recognition that i am part of all that is uh, i am part of others that i meet i'm part of everything it's part of me now some would say that as a response to the fear of death we want to try and find something that makes us feel immortal or permanent whatever it might be 
but um, you know, from the mystic's perspective, it is uh, it is the real. It is the absolute. It is the real. And if we bypass that uh, we, with our spiritual practice, often spiritual practices are engaged in in order to bypass the deep exploration because it's difficult, in order just to keep us comfortable. So much of spirituality, both old age and new age, when you look at it, is me centered. It's about keeping me happy, making me feel better in the world. And there is some merit in that. But if the deep purpose of spirituality is a profound connection with all that is, then just using spiritual practices like meditation, for example, to make you feel more relaxed is to limit something that has otherwise profound potential. Yeah, thank you. That, it, that resonates with me as well. The fact that for me, part of mm, spirituality, if I use that word, it also includes community and it also includes connection and it includes um, presence and ways of, of practicing self and co-regulation. And, and I think the, the thing which is usually referred to as spiritual bypass is when it is an unconscious movement towards feeling better rather than consciously mm -hmm. saying, yeah, we, we can do this for and with each other. Yeah. Yeah. The, the evidence suggests that spiritual, that bypassing like that, the expression I've used, there ain't no, the expression I've used in that wonderful book that you displayed earlier, the expression is that there's no shortcuts. We can think, you know, if I can get into the spiritual life and I can become relaxed and connect with the divine or whatever it is, but not deal with the pain I'm carrying from childhood or the conflict I have with my partner or the terrible ways I feel, unless we deal with those things, and, and attempts to buy, they will simply return and bite us on the bum. Uh, I'm a member of the island community and I meet people on the island who generally come there because they think that by coming to the island, they will get this spiritual high and they won't have to worry about all the crap they're carrying around with them. But of course, what happens is when you go into a place where you even temporarily disconnect from your ordinary life, the stuff you're carrying around you is magnified. It's not lessened, it grows, it becomes, the shadow grows in you because it appears. So there is never in the authentic spiritual life, you cannot bypass the emotional stuff and you cannot use ultimately the spiritual practices of the spiritual life just to keep us content in the world. Well, I'm saying you cannot, maybe you can, but in terms of if the spiritual life has a purpose at all, if there is, is to provide us with that deep connection with all that is, however we experience that, just using it to keep me happy, to have an experience, to make me feel like I've done a whatever, is, is somewhat suspect. But now by saying that, I know I'm sounding very judgmental, which shows you where my spiritual practice needs to go today. <laughs> yeah, as I was hearing you, you talk about... Um... The, the purpose of practice, purpose for spiritual practice for you is, is um, cultivating a profound understanding of connection with all that is, yeah. that everything is sacred. That includes my terror is part of all that is. It includes my stories about whose fault this might be mm -hmm. is part of all that is. Hmm. If we look at the, uh, there's a, a kind of view about spiritual exploration, mysticism. By mysticism, I mean connection with the real, a quality of unity with that all that is, however we define that. God, if you want, goddess, if you want, the light within, the light. One of the things it draws us into through deep practice is the experience of that connectedness of anything, what that deep source is. Life, light, life might be your God, light might be your God. But in that, you recognize that you're part of that. You're not separate from it. And that brings you then to, while you feel the normal egoic human fear of death, you recognize also 
that you do not die, that, that the very essence of which you are made, it's just as we say in, in physics, um, energy cannot be created or destroyed. Well, consciousness is a form of energy. Light is energy. It just simply changes its form. And if you've ever, like I have, have been with countless numbers of people who've died and you've witnessed that dying, you just know something else is going on. It's not a full stop. It's, there's a transition taking place. And often when I've been with people who are dying, the quality of being with them in that dying room is not that different from the quality of being when somebody is being born. There is the same quality of the energy there of something going on. Um, and so if you lift it beyond the, the, the human dimension of what it is to be human, a physical reality, there's something else going on there. But at the same time in that, it, I believe profoundly in the mystical life, it's not as is often seen as something that takes you out of this world to cope with the vicissitudes of it and just to be able to get on with life as it is because you connect with something other or hope for eternal life at some point. No, the, the spirituality that will be relevant to deep adaptation and other movements in relation to saving our planet, if it's savable, is deeply engaged, it's deeply practical. It's almost like to, to, to be spiritual without being connected in community. It's like, it's like an oxymoron. That's where spiritual becomes a spiritual self-pleasuring. It's about you being okay in the world. That's okay, but ground that okayness in finding that part of the world of your point of participation or points of part, wherever it might be. But it brings a different quality to it if, if you are drawing on that deep source within yourself of okayness, of connection, you will have a different experience in the world if you are acting from that source, that center, than if you try and act from the center that is your ego, your functional personality. The latter will exhaust and burn out. The former draws on some source through which your participation in the world may leave you tired, but fulfilled. Mm -hmm. If you're drawing only on your ego resources, you're going to be exhausted and mm -hmm. incomplete. You burn out. Yeah. So particularly for people who are activists, it's not a question of either being spiritual or an activist. It is being a spiritual activist or an activist who is spiritual. Yeah. Sounded a bit dogmatic there. I didn't mean to. You get my point. As you were talking about that, particularly the the uh, that pitfall of burning out, of working so hard from the place of what you call the ego needs, um, that one becomes depleted. And um, yeah, I was thinking about what I've read. Of, of your writing talking about the um let me read this to make sure i get it right the spiritual life is the fierce de-addiction program yeah and i had this sense of that that uh that grasping working so hard that we end up um burning out as being one of the many many addictions that are holding me as a human together right here. I wonder if you could talk about that. That's interesting. Thanks, Katie. I'm just playing with the thought at the moment of burnout. Uh, and I've written an excellent book about this. But uh, and what's come to me is how, see, how we can see burnout as like the cold turkey of the ego. It's what happens when it's just run out of steam. It can't function any longer and wants more but can't get it. Uh, I'm playing with that later, but if the um, when you introduced me, you very kindly said I'm a this and I'm a that. At one level, at a functional personality level, those are truth, and you know, we, and with my ego, I can have a field there giving you lots, lots more I am, so gathering lots of letters after my name and before, and giving me fun. I love it, love it. But it's also a lie 
none of those are who I am. And that can be a fierce challenge to encounter. We, if we have no sense of the center, the connection to depth, however we experience that, we will place the center elsewhere. We will create it somewhere else. We'll break out the booze and keep dancing. We'll seek jobs, we will job hop, we will sex hop, we will TV hop, we will shop hop, we will do anything to invest that energy to find meaning and purpose either outside ourselves or in some various inner quests of identities. <clears throat> Excuse me, those become a kind of addiction, a way of functioning in the world. And to a degree, they work. We have to operate at this particular plane of consciousness that's what they're there for but when we identify them with them as absolutes at some deep level if not a superficial level, we know they're impermanent we know they're going to die we know this body will die and beneath that then is that deep unconscious fear which permeates every aspect of humanity it's there whether we acknowledge or not is that fear that i will die that i will be terminal uh, now then to break through that addiction. For some people, it can happen like that. They will have a road to Damascus experience, or they may face bereavement, or they get a cancer diagnosis, or they're going through divorce or facing prison, all the kind of people we deal here with here on ret retreat here who are experiencing those things. And that shock fractures the perception of who they are. The ego will then go into overdrive to try and hold desperately onto it for some people. Others, it will be, no, what's it all about? This is not what I think life is. I'm not who I think I am. Sometimes you can go through that process by participating in courses or events that enable you to examine yourself, whether you go to a psychotherapist or you join a meditative school or whatever it might be, but you begin to examine the truth or otherwise of who I think I am. That's when, for some people, that's often, that can be a really difficult point because you plunge into the abyss. If I'm not this, if I'm not a wife, a mother, a husband, a friend, a doctor, a child, a, a nurse, a blah, 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 whatever it is, if these things are not who I am, for some people, arguably the majority in my experience, they hit the abyss. Ah, oh, this is too terrifying. I'm not this because then I must be nothing. And if, as the spiritual practices down the ages have shown us, uh, they provide the tools, the wherewithal to work through that, and you come out of the abyss of, oh my God, I'm nothing. This is terrible. I can't bear this. I'm going back to the pub. Or I'm going to get another husband or whatever it might be. You come out of the abyss in which the fear response is very great and you move through it and you realize wow, I'm not nothing, I'm no thing, I am. And in touching into our I amness, then we have the boundless possibility of expression in the world. We have all these roles and identities we can dance with, but we own them, they don't own us. Mm -hmm. We don't, we're not hooked to them, we're breaking through the addiction. And you need like any 12-step program you still need the sessions the getting together the community the practices that keep you away from your addiction because you'll slip back to it ever so easily yeah, yeah. so th there's a process there that can be worked through yeah um i am aware as you're speaking that we've had another guest we've had a previous guest um or the year before last maybe who, who talked about addiction as being a really, really important part of the work that is required for, for deep adaptation. And um, it's Vanessa Andriotti. And I'm, I'm minded, I am mindful of, curious about the fact that the way you speak about and experience and I hear about this, this process of, I don't think you used the word awakening, but maybe I would use that um yeah that word is quite culturally specific mm -hmm. i have a i have a sense that the pain involved of the 
maybe really reluctant realization of I'm not this thing that I thought I was is um, is deeper in a culture where hyper individualism is is so intense. Mm -hmm. Our culture, deeply embedded in, influenced by Cartesian thinking, I think, therefore I am. You could add to that, I do, therefore I am. Yeah. To the contemplative, the mystic, which is the same thing, the person who is engaged with deep spirituality. They reverse that, we reverse that. It's I am, therefore I think. I am, mm. therefore I do. It yeah. reverses the polarity of your awareness of who you are and why you're mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a further point there, which is these addictions, these attachments, there are many spiritual practices which encourage us to work our socks off to get free of, and it becomes really hard work. You've got to do a lot of mindful work. You've got to really discipline yourself. You've got to think constant uh, peace and kindness and everything. And it's, you know, at one level, it's blooming hard work. And so I think what the mystical approach offers is, which is less about working to get free of your attachments and or but working towards discovery discover take the cover off your original source to recover your original attachment to your source which is not an addiction it's a loving relationship it's a quality which then supports you in getting free of your addictions yeah. whatever they are in ordinary reality so the problem and from that perspective from the contemplative practice the problem is not attachments to things or to persons or to identities that we can spend a lot of work trying to get rid of the problem is detachment from our source and that's what the spiritual the mystical contemplative life encourages us towards what is your source what is your what is it you need to reattach to that you've got lost yeah. from what is it you need to awaken to, to that truth that isn't yeah. somewhere else? It's right here, right now, if you mm -hmm. awaken to it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing is uh, that that narrative about working hard is a, is a characteristic of modern culture anyway. So it's less about putting more working hard into your um, experiential space mm -hmm. and rather focusing on shifting awareness into a, just a, a different kind of awareness. Mm. Mm. Ultimately, it's really simple. <laughs> you can reduce all the spiritual life to two things, prayer and fasting. Prayer is opening up to your connection to whatever methods you use to the absolute, to your source. Fasting, putting aside, things that distract you from that, not just food things that distract you from that book and mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily have to, and then you maybe you wake up after we realize oh, bloody hell my life is a prayer bloody what i'm supposed to be doing is right here now and it was that lovely buddhist saying if you want to know where you're supposed to be look at your feet <laughs> it, it mm -hmm. isn't somewhere else it's right here you don't have to go off and go on a 40 degree 40 day retreat on the side of a himalayan mountain mm. um, when you really want to know when you're really ready for it it's there waiting for you yeah but we have the work i think if we have work to do is putting ourselves in that condition that permits that opener. i don't experience the absolute as a spiritual bully doesn't come in knocking and slapping you around the face, but is forever there waiting that when you're ready, when the moment is ready, whether you feel pushed into it or you're ready for it, it is there ready and waiting for you. You just knock and the door will open to you. Yeah. Gosh, I'm sounding so religious this morning. So I'm wondering, I'm, I'm very aware that um, the 30 plus people here aren't here just to hear 
you and I having a conversation and we have um, yeah quite a few questions lined up to 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 ask you and I'm also wondering if now might be a good time to invite you to to lead a short meditation does okay. that feel does that feel okay for you right now it might help the discussion mm. Mm. so it's yeah we're we're past halfway and i i want to honor people showing up with their questions and also recognize that this this process may may answer some questions that are there that haven't been asked okay. uh, let's just have a quiet moment together then just a couple of minutes so we'll just see what comes up And I ask everyone here now just to drop down with me into what in some languages known as the heart space, that place where you go, where you feel deeply, where you seek understanding of who I am and why I'm here, how I make right decisions. So we're going to ask her. The question of that space. If you maybe here you experience the divine in all its forms, it maybe has a name for you. It may be Jesus or Allah or Goddess or Buddha or the light within or nature or the universe. Each of us has a center, your highest self, best self, deepest self. Be receptive to that center now. Yeats in his poem said, things fall apart when the center cannot hold. What is your center? What is it in you helps you stay centered in the world when things are falling apart? Does it have a name? If so, I invite you to approach it now. Be receptive to it. Perhaps how it's been with the, all your life. Maybe you've only recently recognized it. Maybe you're in a place of unknowing. But just be receptive knowing whatever you're experiencing that center, whether you feel it, see it, hear it, touch it, whether it's in your imagination or feelings. I invite you first of all, just to explore gently, what is my center? Where is it? Where are you? What are you? And I invite you now to ask a question of that center, whatever it is to you. Right now, at this point of my life, with this gathering of these people across the wires, as I feel my way towards you, experience you whether near or shallow right now, at this moment, what do you want me to receive? In this moment of inquiry with this group of people, what do you want me to receive? And without editing it or trying to make something work or answer the question if you feel there's nothing there, just simply ask the question, of that deep place within. What do you want me to receive? And then take a, a deep breath, put that question and any response to one side, ask another question. 
Now that I'm here, sitting here with this group of people across the world, what is it you want me to know? Right now, what do you want me to know? Again, don't edit it. Don't try and make something happen if nothing's happening. Sometimes nothing is something. Just ask the question and see what response arises as an image or a feeling or something like that. Then put that to one side at the back of your mind. Take a deep breath and ask the third question. What do you want me to let go of? What am I to let go of? And again, without fixing it, trying to make it work or make something happen, just accept what happens, something or nothing. What do you want me to let go of? And let any response to that go to the back of your mind as well to have a look at later for due discernment. And take a deep breath and bring in the fourth question. with where I am right now, with all that's going on, myself and the world, what do you want me to do? What am I to do? What do you want me to do? So just sit with those questions today or tomorrow or whenever. Asking of that centre, which is yourself, what am I to receive? What am I to know? What am I to let go of? What am I to do in this moment and beyond? You know, whatever has happened, whether receptive or not, you felt, whatever emotions you felt in response to those questions, just let yourself sit with them. Bring them into discernment later on. Perhaps take them to a trusted guide if there is confusion. And just take a deep breath and return with me back into the space where you are. Beautiful, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah, I notice a profound shift in the way I'm experiencing the space that is holding us mm -hmm. now. Yeah, and, and opening up. Mm. One thing I love about the beloved, the transpersonal, is it's also personal. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. So I am now going to uh, open up for questions and I would like Alex, Alex Papworth, first of all, um, would you unmute yourself, Alex, and what's your question for Stephen? So, Alex, if you're not there, I'm going to go. I have. Okay. Uh, great. Need, there was a technical issue, which I couldn't do that. I wouldn't like to miss the opportunity to be asked about the first person to ask a question. So. <laughs> um, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Katie, to start with. Um, yes, that was a long time ago I asked my question. Um, I suppose I'll take my inspiration from nature. Um, so I'm always and when I out of nature. Um, so I'm always trying to, uh, so I guess the question for me is everything has, has a purpose, nothing's wasted. Um, so we started talking about fear and that just piqued my curiosity. What is, what is the role or the value of fear? That's an interesting question, thank you. What is the role, what is the value? It's part of what it is to be human. It teases us to inquire. 
It helps us look after our bodies, warns us when things are dangerous and might be harmful to us, can keep us in the world. If I learn as a child that sticking my hand in the fire hurts, I learn to be afraid of not putting my hand in the fire in the future. I learn to get out of a building when it's on fire. So fear provokes in us a flight or a fight response. It's an absolutely normal human response to danger. I've experienced fear in the presence of some so-called spiritual people because I became aware that they were dangerous in what they were teaching. They wanted to control or abuse me. So fear has a role, it is a part of our nature that helps us to survive, to discern the true from the false, the safe from the unsafe, the healthy from the unhealthy. I'm struck by a guy whose name I can't remember, who because of some psychological effect has no sense of fear about anything. And I watched a video that had me trembling in my knees of him climbing a rock face, I think in Yellowstone, but it could be Yosemite, a thousand feet high, sheer rock face without any climbing equipment whatsoever. And he has no sense of fear or danger. Is that a gift or is it a curse? I think, uh, just to finish the point, I think from the spiritual perspective, fear shows us where we do not yet trust the all that is. It shows us some part of us, if how to express it in religious terms, where, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> our faith in the absolute has crevices where it is not quite as complete as we thought it was. And if I revert to my own Christian contemplative tradition here is, remember Jesus at the point before he's about to be executed, he knows what's coming in the garden of Gethsemane. He's so afraid he sweats blood. In my nursing lifetime, I've only ever seen that happen twice. When person's sweat went pink, the red corpuscles were coming through. It's extremely rare, and a person has to be extremely terrified for that to happen. So here you have this profoundly enlightened being for whom people saw no difference between God and man. Even he gets spared spitless at the end. And what does he do? At that point, he tries bargaining. He says, can somebody else have this, not me? And then he says, thy will, not mine be done. And that is a, that's the profound thing where you hand over in faith to whatever is happening. Somehow you trust the process of the universe, the beloved goddess, the divine, whatever. So fear has a purpose, although it's painful in spiritual terms, in showing us where we need, can go deeper in our relationship to the absolute. I hope that goes some way towards answering your question. We could have a whole day on that one alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really enjoyed that, Alex. Thank you for the question. And I'm, um, two things came up for me as well. One of them is, Sometimes with a particular experience of fear, if I follow it all the way down, I find my love of life. I find joy there. Um, and the fact that it is possible to experience these um, as it's just a feeling. This mm -hmm. is life moving through me. It hasn't killed me yet. This is just a feeling. Mm -hmm. mm, thank you. Um, and I am going to invite Tilly. Will you unmute yourself, Tilly? You you submitted two questions. I love them both. Will you choose one of them, please? I'll give an answer that's going to sound banal. You love them unconditionally. That's the first thing. That's your first spiritual practice. 
the practice of unconditional love for your child. And as a person who has had the role of father and grandfather, believe me, they will throw every spiritual tension at you that they possibly can. Your daughter is your spiritual teacher. As you are hers, it's not one way. There's a mutuality in that. And from my beliefs perspective, some aspect of her beingness, her consciousness, when it moved from eternity into reality, uh, incarnated, whatever you want, she chose you and you chose her. That means there is meaning and purpose in that. It's important. It's a mutuality. It's not just me bringing this child into the world. That was my first point. The second is that struck me was for you to live it. She will learn from you by the way you live it. You live your I amness. You can encourage, love, be with her, but primarily she will learn it from you. You are her most important role model. And the more you live your truth of your nature, the more she will be receptive to that. That's for me too. And then for the third, you can send her off to one of our heart from the schools in Cumbria and we'll teach her. <laughs> but you know, you can encourage, you can help her with discernment of things like if when she reaches a point where she's opening to different forms of education, of learning, of, you know, it can be things like, yeah, try this. Have a look at this. Read this. And my experience of children and being children is they will pay absolutely no attention to you whatsoever. And then maybe a decade later, oh, well, one maybe thought of that, you know. So part of that is also unhooking our natural attachment to wanting our children to be safe and happy and have everything, you know. It's ab you see it, you bear witness to it, you hold it. The agony and the ecstasy, that's what parenting is all about. That's your spiritual practice. You cannot, you cannot manage her awakening for her. You, so that's about us as parents letting go of our attachment, wanting it to be natural. We want our children to be safe and happy. But the trouble is, if we're not careful, if we don't watch that, it doesn't help and support, it interferes. It gets in the way. It stops the very thing happening that we want to happen. And there's that lovely line, I think in Khalil Gibran's work, The Prophet, where he says, your children are not your children. What you are is they are arrows to your bow. You fill the bow with love and then ultimately you have to fire them and trust that they will go, you know, you pour all that love and strength into them. Oh yeah, yeah. God bless you Tilly in your parenting me now from a, a time with my own daughter when a healing moment was needed and I was with a, a, a good friend a guide who was there with me Jeannie uh, who's basically said to me get out the way Stephen <laughs> and what was going on was my fear for her that I want my daughter to be happy I want her to be well I want that, 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 that. I, I look at all that look at it it's all my fear what I what I realized as a parent I had to do was recognize my fear at work in me. I couldn't get rid of it, but what I could do was hold it and, rec and I could stop it getting in the way of recognizing it was blocking me for being fully present and loving with her because I was also buying into my fear for her. Now, I couldn't get rid of that. It's natural part of my psyche. I love her, she's my daughter, da, 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 da. So I, it was part of learning about fear to hold that and not let it get in the way, not let it govern my responses with her. Mm, yeah, thank you, Stephen. I think you haven't experienced the, the, the practice in the Deep Adaptation Forum called Deep Relating, where one of the principles of relating is own your experience. And you just described that, that really beautifully. Mm. Um, I am going to invite Stuart now, Stuart Jeffrey. If you're already, oh, already unmuted. Beautiful, thank you. What's your question, Stuart? There we go. Hello. Um, thank you, uh, Stephen. Um, my question is about balance and the, the gritty pain. Um, is there a need to balance the bliss that, uh, of all that is with, with this gritty pain of reality? And, and, and do we need a sort of dynamic balance of the wonder with the terror in order to, to grow, I suppose? Um, so it's, it's kind of that, that uh, 
do we do we need more um, and, and, and does does it expand in, in two different directions equally? Mm. That's that's a feast. That's a tasty one. Um, the word that's coming to our mind is equanimity. That if we try and push away the horror and seek only the beauty, we'll come unstuck because in pushing away the horror, it intensifies it both for us and for others. And in seeking only the beauty, we push it away because the energy of that grasping or pushing gets in the way. And so uh, there's a lovely uh, Sufi story here. Uh, Yeshua bin Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary, is walking towards Jerusalem one day and he sees a group of people whose pains and faces are full of pain and agony. And he says, what's the matter with you? And he, they say, master, master, we spent all our lives trying to avoid suffering. <laughs> and he, he says, ah, oh, yes, he blesses them and walks on. Then he meets another group whose faces are also full of pain and ag agony. And he says, why are you like this? He says, master, master, we spent all our lives only trying to be happy. And he blesses them and walks off, avoids suffering. And he walks on, uh, meets another group who have pain, etched onto their faces, but also joy. There's a balance there of both of them. And he says, why are you like this? He said, Master, we gave up trying to avoid suffering and experience only joy and we found peace. And he says, truly you have found the kingdom of heaven, blesses them and walks on. Now when I kind of, that's a lovely Sufi story that suggests what you're, with. we learn to hold both. Don't get into battle with pushing the one away or grasping at the other. So we learn to live in the world of suffering with equanimity. My teacher, Ram Das, used the expression, uh, learning to keep your heart open in hell. That no matter what is going on, to use Krishna's words, you put no one from your heart. Uh, and that's the deep spiritual practice of learning to live with that, being in the world, but not of the world. Again, we could have a whole day on this one. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that one, Stuart. Um, we've got, we have got time for one more. And um, Kevin, I would love it if you could unmute yourself and um, share your question with Stephen, please. Um, I can see you, Kevin, but I can't hear you. There you go. Kevin, can you can you hear me? Can you, are you able to ask your question? Okay, so we've got problem with sound. So I'm going to ask a question instead. And um, this, I'm guessing this might be an opportunity, Stephen, for you to talk to us a little bit about your most recent book called Heartfulness. And Kevin's question is: Are you certain that there is a self? What was that? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Are you certain that there is a self? I don't know. And I'm absolutely certain that I don't know. And I'm very comfortable with not knowing. And yet I know. Am I certain? That's a nice one. Yes. As to anything beyond that, and any attempt to divine it or conceptualize it, even the word self is suspect. It's a concept. Beautiful. Thank you for that question. The unknowable known, the known unknowable. But there is something, or even an underhill called the real. So, feels it. The Heartfulness Program, the Heartfulness course here at St. Kentigan School, is all about that. That's, that would be the absolute kind of question we'll be asking in deep exploration to help us break free of those addictions that get in the way 
of coming to know that self. And, um, and coming to not know that self. And to be very comfortable with not knowing. And yet, and yet, we have in the program, in the book, there are 12 methods, 12 letters, 12 approaches that we go through to explore, peel back the layers of addiction, touch deeply into that which is beyond the self, the small self, discernment, authenticity, wisdom, joy, and so forth. But they all come to a conclusion of that which binds them all together. It says, okay, you get all this stuff, now what? What is your path of service? What is your pressure point? We can be overwhelmed in these DA times with the volume of suffering in the world. And it really is a high volume. What do we do? Do we break out the booze and just keep dancing? Or do we try and fix everything and exhaust ourselves as a result? No. Through discernment, we find our pressure point, the bit that is open to us. We can't fix it all. Where's my piece? Where's my little bit? The expression is from Deschard Ambrose, you know, the whole universe is, is on flame. That's the nature of the energy, the lightning that binds everything together. Love, if you like, fire. If there's a vast fire, the universe is a flame. I leave you with this question, everyone. What's your flame? Where's the bit where you burn brightly? Is it simply being, simply, that's a judgmental word, drop that. Is it being a good mum in your own home? Is it being kinder to a neighbour? Is it working in the food bank? Is it breaking the bonds of food injustice? Is it being out there gluing yourself to the streets outside an Amazon store? We all have our pressure point. And we don't have to make that decision for ourselves when we open to the center, recognize the power that comes from that center, that source of life itself. We find our point of service in the world, wherever it may be. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you to each of you who uh, showed up. Thank you to each of you who submitted a question. And I'm sorry that we didn't get chance to hear from everybody. Part of my takeaway from this time together is uh, opening to the possibility that what the divine might be telling me is my, my pressure point, my service is, yeah, the possibility that, that the breaking open the booze and keeping on dancing can be done with reverence, with humility, with, with, with prayer. <laughs> Yeah, so that's my takeaway. I want to say a huge thank you to you, Stephen. I, it feels like we could, we could be circling around these topics and each other for a very long time. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. The next Deep Adaptation Q&A will, uh, will be with Scott Williams from the UN, uh, which Jen will be hosting that conversation on the 31st of January. And I will share details with each of you in a couple of days time. And I'll also share the, uh, the link to this conversation on YouTube and information about uh, Stephen's book. And there was one other thing came, that came in and I'll also, yeah, I'll share that. So huge thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for your support, Stuart, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, Katie. Thank you. God bless. Bye for now. <laughs>